Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the um, webinar. Uh, this is the first of what we hope to be a series of webinars that we will be hosting each quarter to bring everyone up to date on what is happening with regard to law enforcement, line of duty deaths, and what's happening out there in officer traffic safety. My name is Nick Brule, I'm a senior project manager here at the National Law Enforcement Memorial and Museum. And uh, just to get us kicked off here, I'd like to introduce Will Price of the Enforcement and Justice Services Division of NHTSA. Many of you may know him, um, but I'd like to turn it over to Will. Uh, hey, good morning or afternoon, depending on um, where you are in the country. Hang on a second. There I am. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank everybody for joining us today. As Nick said, this is the first in a, in a planned series of webinars that focus on officer safety with an emphasis on traffic uh, related issues. And, and we're very pleased that this is, um, that we have this going. So welcome to the inaugural session. Uh, this is part of our agreement with the memorial and really sort of underscores and emphasizes the importance that we place on the safety of our law enforcement officers that are enforcing traffic laws uh, and operating at, at roadside and, and crash scenes. It, it's critically important to us uh, because our programs don't work without law enforcement and we feel obliged and, and a very serious commitment to doing everything we can to keep you and our law enforcement officers safe out there on the road. And I know that Nick will get into the data, but as of this morning, we have 44 traffic related line of duty fatalities, um, which is up 16% compared to the same period last year. And the tragedy of these losses is that um, the overwhelming majority of them are probably preventable. So our mission here, our, uh, our goal, is to share information that will help support uh, law enforcement and our leaders and managers, supervisors, and folks working at the line level to find ways to keep themselves safe and do the thing that's really most important uh, for any law enforcement officer, and that is to go home safely at the end of your shift to your family. So with that, I will thank you again for joining us and turn this back over to Nick. Okay, and thank you, uh, Will. Um, so what we're going to be doing today is I'm going to be presenting some data to you um, and giving you an overview of line of line of duty deaths. And that's when I start, we're going to start with everything. So everybody gets a picture about what's going on in the country. And we'll talk a little bit about COVID. Uh, we'll then get into the 2020 traffic numbers. And I'm going to do my best to give you all a real in, uh, inside look at what is happening and some of the circumstances involved in some of these crashes. Uh, we'll do some comparative analysis between 2019 and 2020 so you see where things are. And then I'll give you a breakout of five years of data that we uh, went through and show you some percentages about where, I think as mentioning what Will was talking about, where some of these crashes are preventable and where we really, really need to improve. Um, I'll then talk about what regions are really experiencing some of the more larger cases, case numbers and more difficulties. Um, and I'll finish with some upcoming products that we here at the Memorial and Museum uh, are going to be able to put out to you, the consumer, whether it's an LEL or whether you're working on traffic safety issues around the country. Um, we're going to have some information, some additional public service announcements, as well as what we call mini presentations that I'll, I'll just briefly talk about. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Katie, uh, who is with us today. And uh, when I do that, I'll give you her uh, fantastic bio and let you know what's going on with Katie. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, and uh, let's uh, take a look at some of the data here um, for, uh, from the National Law Enforcement Officers and Memorial Fund. Um, just to make sure everybody knows who and what we are. This is a shot of the memorial. If you are a law enforcement officer, or even if you're not, and have never had the opportunity to come to the memorial and you're in Washington, DC, I would certainly recommend that you come and visit the memorial. Um, engraved on the memorial right now 
are 22,217 names of our line of duty deaths, our fallen officers. And of course, uh, this year, those numbers are going to unfortunately increase and uh, COVID-19 is, is impacting those numbers greatly. Um, uh, so this may even surpass 9-11 uh, almost 20 years ago uh, when we had a lot of law enforcement names to add from that day. Um, COVID cases, this is just a snapshot from our um, recently fallen uh, figures that we put out on the Memorial Fund website. We're, we're over 180 cases that are being considered right now with more to come and we're discovering more and more each day. So this is impacting a lot, um, not only just in terms of numbers, but in terms of what we have to do to make sure those cases get taken care of. And what I would uh, ask of any one of you who are aware of a law enforcement related COVID death, um, just make sure that agency has in fact submitted their materials to the Memorial Fund, to us, because we're gonna need time to process those deaths. And we're in a huge push to make sure we're able to meet all of those needs. Um, I mentioned the museum and I am actually broadcasting, if that's the right word, uh, from the museum. I'm in our Hall of Remembrance, so when you see my image and you see what's behind me, uh, those are from uh, the 2019 approved line of duty deaths. The museum opened in 2018. Again, it's uh, some place, something that I would encourage you to come visit if you're here in Washington, D.C. It is underground, but it's almost directly located, uh, located directly next to the memorial. So it's, it's all sort of a package. It's almost a campus, if you will, when you come down here. So let's get in and look at the data. Here's where we are, and as Will already mentioned, um, we are already ahead, uh, and largely because of COVID, um, of where we were in 2019. Um, and if you look at our firearms numbers, they're staying right around where they were for 2019. Um, and again, this is year to date, comparing the exact same period of time in 2019 with where we are in 2020. And I mention that because one of the things that we uh, used to advertise our first webinar was to talk about what we consider to be a dramatic increase in traffic related, that, that second category down there, where you see we're up 16%. When we were first looking at this in late October and early November, uh, the numbers were 30% higher, and that's pretty alarming. And, um, you know, in the context of COVID and everything that's happening in the nation, I think a lot of us here were very concerned by the increase in traffic related fatalities when it seemed like there were fewer cars on the road, fewer miles being traveled. And I think we would anticipate seeing fewer struck by crashes and even fewer collisions, but that has not, not been the case. And in fact, quite the opposite. Now, in the month of November, we did not have a line of duty death related to traffic, a traffic related incident. There were two crashes that ultimately occurred in the uh, month of November, but those two individuals did not um, pass away until December. So there was a, a, a period where the data sort of caught up, if you understand what I'm saying. If you look down at uh, other causes, uh, you see a huge number there, 161%. That is COVID related. Um, and uh, we're adding, as those cases are approved, they're being added to that number. Um, and um, uh, the other cause category deals with a lot of things, not just COVID. In case in that number would be uh, numbers of deaths related to 9-11. We're still experiencing a number of cases where people are dying of cancers as a, as a result of their exposure, uh, both at Ground Zero, Shanksville, and the Pentagon. Uh, and then other causes also has things like drowning, um, helicopter crashes, um, uh, falling off your horse, that, that kind of thing. So now let's talk about uh, traffic related fatalities for uh, 2020. Um, here's what's where we are. You see this is of, of today is the data on the right hand side. And hopefully that's not blocked by um, the uh, side picture of myself and the other participants. Um, but you'll see that uh, we have uh, this, the data on the left for 2019 is for all of 2019. So we're already ahead. We have two more weeks left in December and we are already ahead of where we were for all of 2019 uh, with uh, 27 crashes, 14 struck buys, and then three motorcycle crashes. 
I'm going to get into the data a little bit more as we break down what's happening in some of these fatalities. So as we look at the 27 auto crashes, it's important to note that eight of those were single vehicle crashes. Single vehicle crashes is something that we all need to focus on and understand. And when I say understand, it's something that we really need to study. Um, and we were having a conversation uh, the other day and some folks were mentioning that they really, when they are investigating a line of duty death, particularly perhaps a traffic related death uh, that involves a single vehicle crash, we should perhaps be going back and looking at what that officer did over that first 24 hour period. I mean, are we talking about fatigue? Are we talking about distraction? Uh, what else was going on? Um, and unfortunately, so many of these single vehicle crashes, uh, the officers are not responding to a call. They're not responding to back up an officer. They're just handling administrative duties or tra what we call coming and going, going to uh, pick up a prisoner or going to a um, administrative assignment or, or, or just on patrol. And they are uh, crashing their cars and dying. Um, and if you see, for here, eight of the single uh, vehicle crashes, eight were responding to 911 calls, two were on patrol, two were on self-initiated activity, which means they were looking to stop the car and one was actually involved in pursuit. One of the other data points that came out when I was looking at um, the 2020 crashes that the sheer number of them startled me as I was going through the data, there have been nine uh, crashes that were head-ons. I think with all except one being marked patrol vehicles. Uh, of those nine, five of the striking uh, drivers were impaired. And it's unusual, at least in my experience, to see nationally so many head-on crashes, especially if you look at the data for the year before, I could only find three head-on crashes for all of 2019. So I'm not sure if there's anything there, if that's just a coincidence. Um, but that's something that we look at, and certainly the level of impairment, almost over half of those crashes involved impaired drivers. I mentioned struck by crashes, and these are uh, something that we uh, also focus on um, because uh, we want to make sure we're encouraging officers to use that right-hand approach um, to exercise the principles of traffic, traffic incident management and TIMS. Um, and to take every precaution they can to protect themselves while they're operating in the roadway, on the roadway. And so a little breakdown, a little more detail about what we know so far of these struck by crashes. Four of the 14 officers struck were deploying tire deflation devices. So they were either in the process of deploying them or trying to remove them on the roadway. And we'll talk a little bit more about a couple of those cases in a second here. Three of the officers were struck while on traffic stops. Three, while they were at crash scenes. Crash scenes is one of the most common circumstances where we see officers struck on the side of the road. They're already handling a crash. Sometimes it's weather related where they're, they're, there's already a, a road surface issue that is creating the collisions uh, or contributing to them. But other times uh, it's just driver inattention and people coming right through crash scenes. I don't know if anyone of you remember the Nicholas Dees case several years ago, he was a trooper who was on the scene with another patrol car uh, with a flipped semi on its side, semi-tractor trailer on its side, and a driver updating his Facebook account came in at speed, striking both of the troopers and killing Trooper Deeds. Uh, so traffic stop scenes, I mean, excuse me, crash scenes are, are definitely very dangerous. Uh, one was struck at a checkpoint, traffic safety checkpoint. I used to run those here in DC for DUI. Um, and was always concerned about that. Uh, this is a case, I believe, again, where someone came into the checkpoint uh, at, speed, at speed, they were distracted and uh, struck one of the officers. One was investigating a crime. One was trying to handle a, a person that they were going to, um, uh, who was having a uh, mental health crisis in DC. We refer to that as an MO. I know there are lots of other terms around the country for that. And one was struck while trying to make an arrest. Um, sadly, in three of these cases, the striking vehicles were police vehicles. <clears throat> so you had circumstances, and in one of those cases, it was while an officer was trying to deploy um, our deflation, deflation device, he was struck by another police vehicle coming through that scene. Um, and then I know in one other case, of an officer who was on the sidewalk 
uh, and this was recent, was struck by another vehicle that was attempting to stop a stolen auto. So that's tragic, and it seems to me sometimes even more tragic when it, it's law enforcement impacting other law enforcement. This is some of that data I mentioned earlier, uh, single vehicle crashes. And, and what we'll do is we're going to then now look at 2015 to 2019 because we have all of the 2019 data. The 2020 data is what we're still getting now. So when I prepare the mini presentations, it's kind of like the Ryuka, if you're familiar with law enforcement officers killed and assaulted, that data is always just sort of one year behind. But if you look at the statistics from just 2014 to 2018, you'll see that 47% uh, of those auto crashes were single vehicle crashes. That's a huge, huge percentage as far as I'm concerned. So we, we also have another thing that we really have to deal with in law enforcement, and that's the usage of seatbelts. And I'll give you a little bit of information regarding 2020. But here's that same group of data from 159 fatal automobile crashes between 2014 and 2018. You can see for each year in red, who or how many or what percentage of officers were not wearing their seatbelts. And 2016 was a real outlier because that was a, a large percentage, 52% not wearing their seatbelts. And those of us who were or are in law enforcement know about a number of excuses for that. And um, I'm sure we can talk a little bit more about that as we, as we go on through the, through the webinar. I said I'd help you look at the regions and in that data set, total for total, the percentage of officers who were killed in fatal crashes that weren't wearing their seatbelt was 43%. Again, very high. And, and then 28% of those crashes involving unbelted drivers were in NHTSA Region 6. And that's, we focus a lot of our efforts down there because as you'll see, as we go through the rest of the data, Region 6 uh, annually has the highest number of law enforcement crashes. So here's some preliminary data on the 2020 crash elements, I say, elements might not be the right word. But so far, we know that 10 of the drivers involved in collisions or striking officers were impaired. I mentioned five of those were involved in those head-on crashes. So there's another five that were involved in other cases that was either a collision or striking an officer. That number, of course, will go up as we get in more details and continue our follow-up. Nine officers involved in auto crashes have already been confirmed to not have their seatbelts fastened. Um, and we might perhaps hear about uh, some more of that when we hear from Katie. One of the other things we track as we put together these mini presentations is we look at weather, we look at slow down and move over, uh, we look at what type of organization it is. Uh, so far, our inclement weather in 2020 has not been cited in, in any large um, amount, um, but in our research in the past, icy road conditions and rain, of course, are the two highest contributors or contributing factors to crashes that are cited in crash reports. And then we will look, as I mentioned, slow down, look at slow down and move over. And so far we've confirmed five of the struck by crashes involve violations of the slow down and move over law. Um, and of course, anytime you're hitting somebody on the side of the road, it's almost, you know, goes without saying that they violated that, that law. So here's a look for 2020 at uh, crash, crashes by NHTSA region. Uh, we have a tie between region four and region six. Um, every region has had a crash, um, and uh, if you look at the map, you see where, if you're not familiar, where Region 4 is and where Region 6 is. So that, that sort of Sunbelt region is, is kind of tough. By the way, if you're able to and, and want to, try and send us questions, and we'll try and get to your questions if we can as we go through this. Um, so if you're able to send us a question through the chat, if that works, please do, and we'll try to answer it. I'll put up my contact information at the end and you can always contact me. And if you have some specific research you'd like done, I'll be happy to help you. So in looking at line of duty deaths by state, and this is overall, this isn't just traffic related. Um, and we're gonna hear from Texas. Texas has the highest number with 36 line of duty deaths this year. And then you can see the rest of how they fall out. This is the top eight states with line of duty deaths and um, California and Texas are uh, unfortunately, almost always very high, um, but you see how it's broken out so far this year by state. Um, so here's what I mentioned with regard to products that we are going to put together or have put together and will continue 
to do so. Uh, we're going to put together these many briefings, and hopefully when we're all able to be at conferences and meet each other, I can bring you all of this data on a flash drive, or you can download it from our website. We have a NHTSA page on our, under our officer safety tab, and you'll be able to go in. And these, these uh, ones that are up on the screen need to be updated, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to update them with that 2015 to 2019 data, which is a five-year look. Um, and these are things that you can use at your stations or even in your communities um, to, to point up where officers are having the problems, where we can hit these preventable crashes, and um, give you some real data that you can take to folks so they'll understand what the problems are. We do on our Facebook page, we push out uh, safety messages all the time. Uh, we focus on seatbelts, we focus on uh, crash scene safety, move over and slow down. This is one that we put up. Um, and in fact, this is a, a photo I took um, as a passenger um, when we were, my wife and I were traveling back from um, Virginia Beach. And I was really impressed because there was a traffic stop well up the road with a Virginia State Trooper, which you see here. And everyone had pulled over and created that open lane, every single car. So in that message, I was saying, this is what safety looks like. So I was trying to encourage people to do the right thing. The other thing we do is put out public safety messages or public service announcements about uh, to hear from the horse's mouth, right? These are two that we did years ago. I've already identified a couple of other stories we're gonna do on one, an officer was struck and survived and has just returned back to duty. And we're looking at others. If, if you in your jurisdiction have a good story uh, of an officer who was involved in a crash or was hit and struck by crash and survived and has gotten back to duty um, and is willing to talk about that, uh, we wanna hear their story and make sure it gets shared so that other officers will listen to their fellow officers. And then the last thing is we put out quarterly reports. Uh, we'll be putting out an end of the year report this year and that'll be on our website um, for everyone to see just exactly how we ended the year. And it'll have a lot of the data points that I've put in here uh, for ho hopefully more robust than they are right now. So again, that's my name, Nick Brule, um, And uh, that's my email. I put it big because um, my last name confounds people. They want to spell it U-E-L. It's okay, but if you don't spell it right, you won't get in touch with me. And that's my cell phone. So if you want to call me, call me, and I'll be happy to uh, happy to help you. So now uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Katie Alexander. Uh, she's a law enforcement liaison with the Texas Municipal Police Association. She's also a master peace officer with the Oak Ridge North Texas Police Department. And pretty soon we're going to be calling her Dr. Alexander because she's working her way towards her PhD. Go ahead, Katie. Like Nick said, uh, my name is Katie Alexander and I'm a law enforcement liaison in the state of Texas. And, I, you know, Will likes to hear me always say every time I go out and I teach and I'm like the great state of Texas because, uh, you know, they're, they're honestly, and I know I have so many of you guys in here, but there really is no better place to live than in Texas. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you guys and uh, hopefully you guys will uh, get a little bit from this presentation that I've put together for you. So um, I want to always start out by recognizing our officers that that we lose. Um, unfortunately, when I was going through and I was creating this presentation, um, you know, Nick hit on it several times and, it, and it's something that really makes me cringe all the time. Every time I hear it is that Region six, Texas, region six, Texas. Um, we're number one in a lot of things. Uh, law enforcement line of duty deaths is one thing that, you know, we strive really, really hard to get uh, away from that number. And, you know, we wanna just, we don't wanna have any deaths uh, anywhere, but unfortunately in Texas, we suffered uh, an extreme amount this year. So I always like to start out by, by kind of sharing uh, just a little tribute to them. So I put this together for you guys. You may want to turn down your volume because there are bagpipes involved.
So, ladies and gentlemen, obviously, as you can see, uh, you know, these were just Texas officers just this year. Uh, in the year 2020, we, we suffered an enormous loss uh, out here in Texas. So, you know, I, I want to kind of just highlight on some of the few. And Nick spoke, um, you know, a lot about what, what we're seeing out here, not only in Texas, but all over the nation. Um, I am a huge proponent when it comes to seatbelts. And anybody can tell you that if you're sitting somewhere with me and you're another officer and you have that, that idea of talking about, you know, well, I don't want to put my seatbelt on because of this or because of that. Um, you know, my friends are, they already tell them, you know, hey, you're, you're going to hear a lecture from her and you're probably not going to win this argument. Um, because that's exactly what I do. Uh, I don't like to argue with people, but I want to make sure that they understand the consequences. Um, and that really, honestly, when you choose not to wear your seatbelt, you know, you're leaving your family behind and that that's just unacceptable. So just to highlight a few that we had here in Texas this year, um, this is uh, Officer Nicholas Reyna uh, from the Lubbock Police Department. Um, I know Nick was talking earlier that you guys are getting snow out there. I can't even imagine uh, driving in the snow. I grew up in Germany. I'm a military brat, but um, I, I can't even imagine how people drive in the snow. It is very, very uh, scary for me. So, um, you know, unfortunately, we do get snow up in Lubbock, Texas. And out in Lubbock, he was out there uh, working a crash. And he was actually working with a, a lieutenant from the fire department. They were out there on scene of a crash. And unfortunately, the lady lost control of her vehicle and struck both of them and, on, and actually killed not only uh, Officer Rena, but the lieutenant from the fire department as well. So, you know, I'm kind of unfortunately going to give you guys a tour around Texas, I guess you could say, because, you know, starting with Lubbock, for those of you guys familiar with Lubbock, it is uh, up there on the north side. Um, and then I kind of want to move into, uh, you know, something that Nick touched on earlier. Uh, Bell County, Texas is, for those of you guys, and I know we have a lot of law enforcement that are former military, um, but for those of you guys that are familiar with Fort Hood, this is where, this is where Bell County is, Fort Hood, Texas. Um, and so, you know, Nick talked about when they go out there and they set out the spikes and unfortunately, uh, Deputy Roden lost his life going out there. He was setting out uh, some spikes um, for a pursuit that they were having of a stolen vehicle and he was struck and killed on April 26 of 2020. So just yet another example of, of things that, that are happening out here in Texas. Um, this young lady here, uh, police officer, in Beaumont, Texas. And for those of you guys not familiar with Beaumont, but that is the far east side of, of Texas. And this young lady, as you can see from her picture, is extremely young. She's only 23 years old. All three of my kids are actually older than her. So when we learned of this news, it's like, you know, we look at it and say, you know, what on earth, what, what happened with this? And I always want to find out the details. And so um, speaking with, uh, you know, some, some of the law enforcement out in that area, what I learned was 
you know, she was actually already getting off of shift when she forgot her handcuffs at the jail. And so she asked another deputy for a ride to the jail to get her handcuffs before she went on sh off of shift because she was getting ready to get off. And so she hops in his vehicle. She's in the passenger side of the vehicle and they are struck by a drunk driver uh, that was at point two, um, you know, over the legal limit. And, you know, so when we look at incidents like this and things that happen like this, she was 23 years old. She hopped in the passenger side. She was not wearing her seatbelt. Uh, unfortunately, um, the, uh, the young man that was driving, he did, well, fortunately he did not lose his life, but he did suffer quite a bit as well. So here we have just another yet uh, an example of what Nick was talking about, the failure to use the seatbelts. Um, obviously she's 23, she has not been on the job uh, that long and something this quick can take her life and take her entire career from her. So again, you know, we, we tend to focus a lot on our seatbelt issues that, that are happening out here. Uh, this is Corpus Christi, Texas. Um, this is getting a, a little bit closer to the water down, uh, down further south. And, you know, so here we have, um, you know, Daniel McCollum and, you know, he's out there and all he's doing is conducting a traffic stop. And here we are again with a drunk driver. In, in the state of Texas, as Nick was sharing, you know, we rank number one in law enforcement, line of duty deaths. We are also up there in that fight with LA County, um, usually number one in the entire nation for DWIs. And so a lot of what we try to do is, hey, if we can focus on the, the issue at hand, you know, maybe we can save our own, um, you know, by going out there and just spreading that message. So, you know, again, he was out there, he, you know, he left behind three children and his wife, of course, um, you know, just, just on a traffic stop and was killed by a drunk driver. So, uh, you know, again, we have a lot of, a lot of problems out here in Texas, Region 6 as a whole. Uh, this is Sergeant Sebastian Rios. This is one of our most recent, um, unfortunate line of duty deaths. And uh, Sergeant Rios was on his way to work to, uh, to work at the airport here in Houston. And so as you can see, I kind of took you, you know, from, from way up north down to east and, and then circled you back to Houston. And the reason why I always want to stop at Houston is because that is, that's where I'm from. Um, I've spent the last 20 years in Houston. Uh, you know, some people refer to Houston as ground zero because this is where we have an enormous amount of our problems uh, when it comes to, to traffic, anything related to traffic. Um, we have a lot of road rage because of our, our traffic problems in Houston. Uh, you can literally take two hours just to go to work in the morning because of the amount of traffic that we have in Houston. And so our efforts are, you know, are great out here in this area. Uh, but Sergeant Rios unfortunately encountered a road rage incident and uh, he was he was actually killed by gunfire, uh, but it was due to road rage and you know again, it could have been prevented. So as you can see, you know we've lost an extreme amount of officers, um, but I want to share a little bit about our efforts here in Texas because we are just growing by leaps and bounds. We are trying so hard uh, you know to, to just do as much as we can to stop what's happening out here in Texas. Uh, some of our efforts, of course, include training. Uh, that is a lot of what I do. Prior to COVID, unfortunately, COVID, March 9th was the last day that I was able to, to travel and go out and, and do training. But, you know, the law enforcement liaisons here in Texas and all across the nation, either they, they are that networking tool to kind of share the training that's available, get you the training that's available, or do the training ourselves. And uh, here in Texas, we do a lot of that training. And we teach a distracted driving class, which focuses on anything and everything related to traffic safety. So training is a big one for me. Uh, as Nick said, um, you know, education is, is something that is near and dear to my heart. Um, I, I truly love to learn about everything I possibly can. Um, but more importantly, I like to share it with other people. So with that, we also have traffic safety coalitions. Um, you know, if you guys are not a part of your traffic safety coalition, uh, reach out to your DOT because they have these coalitions where you can network and get your partners and your stakeholders and everybody involved um, that is really trying to just promote the same message that everybody is. Um, part of our traffic safety coalition in Houston, uh, we have a DWI initiative. As you guys know, it's drive sober, get pulled over. That's the time we're in right now. And so one of the things that we just recently did was we partnered with GHSA and Lyft, and we are currently 
um, promoting a, a, a big deal out here in Houston uh, with our DOT and our traffic safety specialist. Um, you know, and we're going to be giving away three thousand ten dollar lift vouchers uh, for New Year's Eve. And so we're trying to spread the message. Hey, you know, go on there, register for this QR code because. We want you to plan ahead. We don't want bad things to happen in Houston. Uh, we don't want bad things to happen anywhere, but one of the initiatives that we were able to, to get, and I'm excited about it, um, is that we were able to partner with these agencies and Silver Eagle and the district attorney's office in the Harris County. And everybody kind of came together and said, you know what, we need to do what we can to stop what's happening, especially on New Year's Eve when everybody wants to go out and have a good time. And our biggest message is for everybody to, you know, hey, go out there and have a good time, but plan ahead. If you plan on drinking, always plan ahead. And, and that is the most important message that we can send. Um, so with that, we also are, uh, we have move over initiatives and these are run uh, a lot by our Department of uh, Public Safety, our troopers. Um, our troopers do a phenomenal job out here in Texas with, with traffic safety. Um, and they have on the third Wednesday of every month, they have a move over initiative. And I was telling uh, Will and Nick earlier this morning about just a few hours before we got started. And if I could have downloaded the video fast enough, I would have. But a few hours before we got started, they posted uh, on their Facebook page uh, a really neat video about move over. Because here we are in, in 2020 and we passed this year years ago, this law years ago, but so many people are unaware about our move over law about moving over or you know, reducing their speed to 20, mile, 20 miles under the speed limit in order to protect not only our officers, but our tow truck drivers and everybody that's out there on our roadways that, that is out there on the side of the road. So our move over initiative, uh, you know, I go out there and you know, moving down to our selective traffic enforcement program, that is a huge, huge part of my job. Um, I absolutely, I live and dream this, these things because especially when it comes to grant building season. So part of my job is, is going out, recruiting agencies and saying, hey guys, uh, do you know that the Texas Department of Transportation, they have this step program and there's funding available and I can help you get it. And not only can I help you get it, but I can help you actually build your grant. Um, and just recently, as of a couple of years ago, um, you know, I kept getting people in law enforcement reaching out to me and saying, you know, hey, I need help with Grant, you know, and I heard you're the person and, you know, and then they started asking, well, you know, is there is there credit involved, you know, for commission on law enforcement. And I said, well, there's not really but, you know, hey, maybe that's something that we can do. And so our team as the LEL team, you know, we decided, you know what, let's make a, a this is how you manage a grant. And this is how you work a grant. And a lot of it is focused on uh, high visibility enforcement. In the state of Texas, we have moved to our, our selective traffic enforcement has actually moved to data-driven. Um, this is something that, you know, data-driven is something I am very passionate about. Um, and not only because I see it where you're, you're literally killing two birds with one stone you are able to take your data and say, you know what, this is where our crashes are happening, but this is also where our crime is happening. And when you overlap those, those two maps together, you say, oh my gosh, we can focus on these particular areas and do both at the same time. But the reason that, that I strongly believe in a data-driven approach is mainly because it's community oriented. It is based on practices that were way back when, when we were involved with the community. A lot of the problems that we have here, um, not only in Texas, but nationwide, we had, you know, we had protests, we have, you know, we have this mass division between law enforcement and the community. And, you know, a, and a lot of this actually kind of falls into what is happening with our law enforcement out here. Um, you know, the, the disconnect between law enforcement and the community brings that, that, you know, that sense with the community that, you know, maybe, I can't trust this, you know, these law enforcement, and that is that is definitely not something that, you know, that we want to um, to have actively. And so, what we're looking at is saying, you know, what we can focus on community oriented behaviors, and you know, and I always love to give the example of Dallas Police Department. Um, Dallas Police Department a few years ago was having a, a very very big problem with violent crimes, and they had hit, you know, 100 murders within the first several months of the year. 
And, and so they said, you know, we, we don't know what's going on out here, but we could sure use some help. And so what we did in Texas, not me personally, but uh, our governor uh, sent a bunch of troopers out there. And for those of us that have been in law enforcement for quite some time, and, and especially in Texas, there is this, this, uh, this strange myth that, you know, the troopers are out there and they only do traffic. Well, troopers went through an academy and they know how to do other things, but yes, they do focus on traffic. And so with this initiative, they sent all these troopers out there and, you know, their focus was high visibility enforcement, though. It was not necessarily responding to calls and doing, it was just their presence alone was going to make a difference. And it did. It did exactly that. So in that short period of time, they ended up with over 17,000 traffic stops, okay? Traffic contacts going out there, going beyond that stop. And of that, there were only 1,390 citations written and over 24,000 of, of warnings that were written. But they made a significant difference. And that difference was they got 568 uh, drug seizures. They got 105 uh, handguns, um, 297 felony arrests. They did, they made a major impact in what they did out there in the Dallas area. Now, with that being said, you know, the problem that they had and that, that, that kind of stemmed and came into the way was the community. The community, the, the community that they were focused on had basically this idea that said, you know what, you guys are picking on us, you know, you're saturating our area and some of the same people are being pulled over, you know, two times in a day. Um, and so in speaking to um, the vice president over at Dallas Police Association recently, and I was talking to him about this and he said, you know what, Katie, it was effective. What they did out there was definitely effective. They, they reduced the crash, they reduced the crime, um, you know, great things happen. But then towards the end of it, the community was a little outraged. And I said, you know, well, what do you think could have, could have solved that problem? And, you know, and my specific question was, did you have community involvement before you actually made this effort? And his response was, no, not really. But after the fact, you know, we were trying to kind of, um, you know, make, every, make peace with everybody. And so, you know, again, when we look at high visibility enforcement and looking at data-driven approaches, um, my passion, my, you know, my whole idea on this is, you know what, if we get the community involved to begin with and you let them know your efforts, I can assure you that bad things won't happen afterwards. They're gonna be very thankful that you're in there. If you go into a community and you explain to them, hey, we're having bad problems in this particular area and we're going to go out and we're going to pull over cars. We're not necessarily looking at enforcement anymore. We're looking at engagement. We want to engage the community. We're not looking at ticket driven anymore or punishment. We're looking at engaging the community um, and make them understand that, hey, um, you know, if I pull your vehicle over and little Timmy has gone missing, you know, how many officers do you want pulling over cars in your area if your child has gone missing? And I can assure you that every answer from every community member will be every single one of those officers need to be pulling over cars. Not only do we need to be pulling over cars, but we need to be asking questions. Because if you do not ask those questions, you know, where are you headed to? Well, you know, if you're in Dallas and you're headed to Oklahoma, but you're going south, there's probably a problem there. And so that is where we continue to have that conversation and we do what we're trained to do and investigate. And so that is what we look for. And I, I'm so happy that our, um, our selective traffic enforcement program has gone to this data-driven approach because not only is it more community oriented, but it works in getting officers motivated. And I will share with you that um, one of our largest agency, actually our largest agency in Texas, um, the Harris County Sheriff's Department, uh, they have been a, a, a step unit for quite a number of years. And a lot of the problem that they were seeing in working step was you know, TxDOT was giving them funding, but they were having problems getting officers to work it because, you know, officers didn't want to go out there and they were, well, you know, I got to make a DWI arrest and I got to make a, and, and so it kind of, um, it, it didn't motivate officers as much. And I can tell you, they have grown by leaps and bounds. They are doing a phenomenal job in, in this whole data-driven approach that they are doing. And they currently, as of right now, have 28 of their deputies waiting to be put on the list for, for working step. Um, that is how highly motivated these deputies are from going from, you know, having trouble getting people to fill these slots 
now they're wondering, oh my gosh, are we going to actually have enough money to, to pay these guys because we're going to use it so fast because everybody wants to do it. And so, you know, I, I love what they're doing out there. They have decided to become a full-time data-driven agency and, and great things are going to happen on there. And I cannot wait to see the research on that. And so, you know, those are a few things that, that are happening out here. Um, we have great things happening in Texas. And I, you know, I can only say that my hope is you know that very very soon we will no longer be number one in anything. Um, we'll pass those reins on to down somebody else, um, you know, or hopefully just nobody at all. And so with that, I kind of just want to share with you, you know, how important your law enforcement liaisons are. My position as a law enforcement liaison in the state of Texas, I cover a lot of territory, literally almost half of Texas. Um, but I, I do that because you know I, I say look. I want the big agency. My boss just kind of says, Katie, you know, um, you, you take on a lot. I'm like, yes, but you know, I, I, I need to be busy. I need to be doing things. And, you know, I, I want, I want, you know, to solve the problems, you know, and I want to be able to, to help with that. And my team is just wonderful in going out there and getting people educated on what we have available to them. And so our law enforcement liaisons, guys, there's over 200 of them all across the nation. There is one in your area, wherever you are. Um, and, you know, if you have trouble locating them, contact me. I'm happy to put you in touch with them. Um, I'm what they consider a networking queen because I absolutely, I love talking to people. As I stated before, I'm a military brat. I see no stranger. I, I run into no stranger. I mean, I am just one of those people that, that love to talk to people. So we are all either sworn or retired law enforcement uh, officers all over the nation. Um, I myself, am, and like Nick said, I'm still active in the city of Oak Ridge North, which is in North Houston. Um, you know, we are the link between the Highway Safety Office and law enforcement. And we can go in there all day long and say, hey, this is what we have available. And, you know, with us, you know, a lot of the things, in, and I know that Nick and Will wanted me to share like, well, you know, Katie, what are you doing out there as an LEL? Well, I do quite a bit. I mean, unfortunately, my boss kind of gets mad at me because sometimes I do a little bit too much hours, um, but, um, but I enjoy my job and I love what I do. And so one of the things that, that I do, I utilize social media. And if you guys are not out there utilizing your social media, uh, you, you need to get on there. And the reason I say that, guys, is because um, I am part of a very, I, I guess I could call it an elite group, um, even though we're not really elite, we're just special. Um, but there is a Facebook group of officers and um, they're truly just like another family to me. Um, and so this group that I'm in is just Texas police officers. Um, those are the only people that are in there. You have to have credentials in order to get in there. And this group was started um, by a very dear friend of mine. Um, and you know, she created this group and said, you know what, we need a place for Texas, you know, hey, we're Texas law enforcement officers, you know, we do things different than everybody. And, you know, we need a, a place where we can kind of connect, ask questions to each other, share what we have going on. And I will tell you that this 1200 police officers that that are in this group 1200 plus uh, that are in this group have helped me um, just a phenomenal amount. Um, and when I say that they've helped me, uh, a lot of it has to do with our STEP program. Every year when we open up our grants, I and they can expect it from me, I get on there and go, hey guys, uh, STEP grants have opened. If anybody's interested in participating this year, this is what it entails. And I give them a little short, um, you know, and then I just say, contact me and I'll put you in touch with whoever your traffic safety specialist is or your, your law enforcement liaison. And I will get emails and Facebook chat messages and, you know, and I've noticed that we have grown an extreme amount. Now, am I playing middleman for just a minute? I don't mind doing that because what we're doing is we're getting more agencies on board because TxDOT truly believes that, you know, law enforcement, they're the number one ally when it comes to fixing the problems on our roadway and, and you know, the crashes happening on our roadway. And so, again, um, you know, I utilize them. Um, unfortunately, the founder of this group, we just buried her yesterday. She put an enormous amount of police officers together in touch with each other. Um, and unfortunately, we were all at her funeral yesterday. Um, she spent 22 years as a law enforcement officer. She saw the need for that connection, um, for everybody to kind of, you know, get together, talk to each other, see what's going on. Um, and so, 
again, utilize your law enforcement liaisons because guys, I can tell you right now, um, you know, they are a wealth of information. They are that connection. Uh, one of the things that, that I always tell people uh, when they're working the step program, you go out there and you work the step. Okay, well, you guys are out there working step. Hey, by the way, did you know that DPS does move over every third Wednesday of the month? You know, if you're working step on a third Wednesday of the month, why don't you call DPS and tell them to come out there and watch your back? Because we need more people to watch our back. Bad things are happening to us while we're out there on the roadway. And the message is not getting out to our community about moving over. And so getting that message and getting these law enforcement agencies to connect together and say, hey guys, why can't we just work together? Um, there's nothing wrong with working together and getting things done. Um, let's play some leapfrog while you're out here doing high visibility enforcement, you're pulling over vehicles. Let's go out there and, and you know, see if we can make sure that these guys are protected. Um, so, you know, that is just basically a little bit about our efforts here in Texas. Um, you know, as you can see, I get excited about speaking about stuff like this. Um, it is it is something that um, I truly believe that that we can actually make a difference out there. Um, and that's really ultimately everybody in here. That That's what we're in here for. Uh, everybody in here wants to uh, serve and protect and do what we but we also have to remember, you know, hey, we got into it to help people. I did not get into law enforcement for any other reason than to protect people, to help people, to help the victims out there. And yes, guys, DWI, there is a victim involved in, in DWI crashes. And that is something that falls to the wayside quite a bit. Um, and so we need to, we obviously are, we're doing better in Texas. And I am hoping that by this time next year, Nick will be saying, guess what? Texas is not number one anymore and they are doing great things. Um, I like to consider myself somewhat as a cheerleader for these law enforcement agencies that are out there doing this. Um, I wasn't a cheerleader in high school. I was a soccer player. Um, Janice out in Florida, she's our LEL out in Florida. Um, she was a cheerleader and you can tell just by speaking with her, but you know, that's a lot of what we do. And um, you know, again, every one of us is passionate about what we do. We're happy to connect you with anybody that we can connect you with. Um, so I wanna leave you guys with my contact information. Um, you know, this is my work cell phone number that is transferred to my personal cell phone number, um, mainly because I live out in um, a very rural area and the internet isn't so wonderful with that phone. So um, I wanna thank you guys, everybody for joining us. Um, I hope you guys got a little bit from this presentation. Uh, there are quite a few solutions out there and we just all need to work together to, to get to those. So thank you, Nick, for having me. Yeah, Katie, that's great. Uh, my pleasure. Um, if everyone's uh, got Katie's information, um, uh, we can open up the screen and I'll, um, I'll answer a couple of the questions. We've got a few minutes left. Um, but thank you, uh, Katie, for, for that and telling us all about what's going on in Texas. And there's no doubt you're quite passionate about it, which uh, I truly appreciate. One of the questions came in asking about uh, shootings and traffic stops. And do we ga gather data from traffic stop related shootings? If I understood the cor question correctly, the, the answer is yes. Um, now, when we're dealing with shootings, we uh, will of course do a different analysis. I used to have a grant for the Valor program as well as from the COPS office. And we would put together, in fact, they're still on our uh, website, studies uh, called Fatal Calls and Deadly Encounters. And that tracks a lot of the circumstances involved in traffic stops that result in shootings. So at the Memorial Fund, we do, we do look at that. And of course, you, uh, you may know the law enforcement officers killed and assaulted Leoka under the FBI. They also look at those circumstances. Uh, someone asked about rural versus uh, cities or municipalities with regard to tr crash volumes. In other words, who's experiencing the most? Municipalities or municipal police agencies uh, have the highest number of uh, vehicle crashes. Um, there are a lot of rural agencies that do have them, but of course, more cars in the municipalities um, and uh, more, more crashes. Um, another question was asked about attenuator trucks at crash scenes. Have they helped reduce crashes? I, I don't have any. I, I, I'm sure they do. Perhaps somebody at NHTSA or from Federal Highway or maybe someone out there would have the answer, at least some anecdotal evidence to show that they've been there and their positioning has saved lives. I know that there is a wonderful story from Irving, Texas, with regards to some firefighters who had been to the Tim's class in, in uh, Maryland, and uh, on a 
crash scene, they decided to leave their hook and ladder across two lanes of traffic while the, uh, I think it was Irving, Texas, police officers were completing their investigation. And sure enough, a semi came around the ramp and hit the fire truck instead of hitting the officers. Unfortunately, some firefighters were hurt, but I don't think they were seriously hurt. Um, one of the other questions that we get and that we want to deal with, and it involves seat belts, is, you know, are I, am I going to drown if I'm in my car and I roll my car and I'm in my seatbelt? And the answer is no, it has never happened. And, you know, this notion in law enforcement about being trapped by your seatbelt or um, I was in law enforcement for 25 years here in D.C., um, and I wore my seatbelt all the time. I wore my seatbelt all the time. And body armor is something else we look at. Um, and there's no reason you cannot or should not have your seatbelt on. Now, I, I admit I, I lost a couple of name tags trying to quickly get out of that belt. And, yeah, there's equipment around your waist, particularly if you're right-handed. It, it connects right behind your, your gun, but it is something that saves your life, and there's no reason not to wear it. So the seatbelt is something that we really, really have to focus on. And then one of the other question is, uh, was, um, do we capture whether officers are wearing their body armor and or a visibility vest? And the answer is yes. Uh, that is one of the things we look at. So if there's a struck by, we want to see if they had a visibility vest on, particularly if they're handling a crash scene or directing traffic or doing something that they really should have gone and thrown their visibility vest on. And then body armor, for sure, because it protects you. It protects you in a struck by, it protects you in a crash, and of course, it's going to protect you from uh, firearms, not all of them, of course. Um, but that's that's really it for today. I want to thank everybody for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to Will real quick to see if he has any parting comments. I want to thank Katie Alexander and, of, of course, Hannah Shula, who is uh, here helping us today uh, do our first inaugural webinar. I promise it'll go smoother next time, and I really appreciate your indulgence. Uh, do you want to say a few words, Will? Yeah, just to say thank you again to everybody for joining us. Uh, apologies for the technical difficulties, but, you know, it's, uh, we, we seem to have gotten through it. There was the question about the attenuators, and just very quickly, um, uh, I think Jack Sullivan may be with us uh, today, who does a wonderful job of collecting data um, and sharing that information. So we'll follow up on that question and see if we can't get you an answer back through, uh, through Nick. But once again, thanks again, everybody. Uh, we're wishing everybody a very happy, healthy, safe holiday season, and we'll see you on our next, uh, our next webinar. Okay, thank you, everybody.